And with that, I'm going to introduce our next wonderful panelists, which again, I started to share a little bit of information on, but we're gonna move from here to our registry discussion, which is really exciting, groundbreaking, launched this year in May of 2021 and recently just went global. So we're super excited about that. So I'm gonna start by introducing Dr. Sarah Selig, who is the co-founder and director of the Kiroam Initiative. As I had mentioned earlier, Sarah recently became involved with ocular melanoma in general when her husband was diagnosed when they were fourth year medical students, if you can imagine that. So very young in their medical careers and totally changed the trajectory of both of their lives. Um, at the time of his diagnosis, as I mentioned, there was very little available and Sarah and Greg became fierce advocates, not only for Greg, but for the overall ocular melanoma community. So Sarah has formed the Kiroam Initiative and I know that she's very proud to see where we are today and particularly to talk about this registry. When she's not out advocating for ocular melanoma patients and working on registry data and solving huge research problems she, in all of her spare time. She's also an associate physician in the Department of Internal Medicine, Division of Global Health Equity at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston and is an instructor in medicine at Harvard Medical School. So, I mean, your resume, Sarah, every time I read it, I'm like, I don't, I don't know how there are enough hours in the day to do all you do. Um, and with her, is Dr. Richard Carvajal, who has been an incredible advocate for the MRF and the Kiroam Initiative. Not only is he working in ocular melanoma, but he's also been instrumental in our mucosal melanoma work. He is currently the Associate Professor of Medicine at Columbia University Irving Medical Center, where he is both the director within the Division of Hematology and Oncology, um, as well as the director of the Melanoma Service. He's the co-leader of the Precision Oncology and Systems Biology program. And his research is focused on developing novel therapies for patients with melanoma and other cancers with the overall objective of controlling and curing their diseases. And as someone who interacts with many patients who are also patients of Dr. Carvajal's, he is an absolute superstar who works with nothing but compassion with everyone that comes into his clinic. So, uh, with that, I am going to turn it over to them to talk about our vision registry, and then we will be taking questions at the end. So as you are listening, please, please, please type your questions into the Q&A box. And once we finish the formal presentations, I will be facilitating those with Sarah and Rich. So Sarah and Rich, over to you. So thank you so much, um, Kylie, for that introduction. Um, I think just sitting watching those slides instills in me, um, as many of you watching, I'm sure just feel or know the feeling of isolation when you're first diagnosed and um, as a patient. And um, I think those slides highlight for me just the amazing community that's grown over the years for which I feel very grateful. So thank you for that. Um, and um, so you know, I think as um, you have just heard from Kylie, my journey with um, ocular melanoma is a very personal one and really started when my husband Greg was diagnosed um, in 2006 with um, the primary eye tumor. We were in our early 30s at the time, and I imagine as many of you can relate, um, we were very scared and felt very isolated at the time of his diagnosis. And unfortunately, at the time that Greg was diagnosed, um, there was no website we could go to for information. There were no support groups. Um, and so we really had to look for rocks um, uh, along our journey and um, turn them over and look for information along the path. Um, and uh, it was really, I think, those early feelings of isolation that, um, that really drove a lot of our early advocacy work. Along the way, um, we have had the opportunity to meet amazing patients and families um, along this journey who similarly are driven to advocate. Um, and one of those patients is um, Summer Heath and her family. And Greg and I met her and um, were just really inspired 
um, by her, she was younger than Greg was when she was first diagnosed. She was actually diagnosed only two years um, after she graduated from high school. And um, as we can all imagine being in her shoes that completely turned her world and her family's world upside down. And um, to combat the feelings of fear and isolation, they too started advocating for Summer and for their family and for the ocular melanoma community. Um, and I think these feelings that Greg and I felt and that Summer and her family felt um, even though we hadn't met yet at the time, there's uh, a lot of similarities with those early feelings of um, wanting to connect with other people, wanting to get more information, but running into barriers and trying to do so. Along the way, um, not only have we met amazing patients and family members, but I think um, as many of you can also relate, we have met amazing clinicians and dedicated researchers. And early on, several of the clinicians treating Greg shared with us their own frustrations in trying to treat patients and trying to research this disease that they also felt isolation. And they also felt fear and frustration for what they could or could not offer their patients. Um, and so I think just a lot of similar feelings from kind of the different sides um, the different roles in the ocular melanoma space. And it was really those perspectives that led Greg and I early on to think that the advocacy work that we were doing on behalf of him and our family, we could really elevate and do for the community at large as we were hearing that other patients and family members felt very similar to us and the clinicians and researchers felt very similar to us in their, from their own perspective. Um, I think that really led us um, to the to catalyze um, the start of CureOM, which you've you've heard a lot um, from Kylie already about that. So I, I won't go more into that. Um, but um, it was really those early feelings of isolation that led us to want to um, bring together community. And similarly. Um, for Summer, as she went through her early treatment at such a young age, she slowly learned that other young women in her community in Huntersville, North Carolina, were also going through something similar. And to combat her feelings of fear and isolation, she similarly started to reach out to other patients on Facebook. She started hearing that other people in her community also had this disease at a very young age. And I think Summer and her family um, found a lot of comfort in that sense of community, but I think it was also a passion for them to, as Kylie mentioned, to, to look for some clues and how to unlock uh, information that could um, contribute to understanding this um, cluster in Huntersville better. And so I think what Greg and I were feeling and what Summer was feeling early on, and as I mentioned, the clinicians and researchers also, we were feeling these barriers um, in the field, not only to um, education and support for patients, treatments. Um, we know this is a rare disease, a small um, patient population with not that many treatment centers, um, a real need to bring the patients together, both in, for a sense of community for patients, but also to integrate that patient voice into research priorities, into understanding how to advance clinical trials, into raising funds um, for research and bringing um, more resources into the field. And then of course, particularly with a rare disease, um, it was hard to bring people together to really get a clear understanding of the epidemiology of this disease, to really understand what is going on in Auburn, Alabama and Huntersville, North Carolina, and to have a centralized system where we could bring all of the different stakeholders together and bring that information together. And on the left side of the slide, Basically, um, what we're capturing here is that there are currently a number of different registries um, at different levels. And one of those registries is a state level cancer registry that all states have. But for a variety of reasons, um, what uh, this is Kitty Gordon's research has found that um, ocular melanoma cases were not being captured adequately by these state registries. And so we were losing a lot of information in this and we weren't being able to connect the dots. And as I don't need to tell this audience, um, outcomes are poor in this disease. And not, together, knowledge gaps, um, challenges to global collaboration lead to these poor patient outcomes. And for those of us 
um, you know, patients and family members, these are unacceptable. And for clinicians caring for patients, these are unacceptable outcomes. Um, and this motivates us to change the field. And so um, through um, CureOM, as you heard, we've had a number of different um, scientific initiatives. And really at both those meetings, um, as well as at the patient meetings, there were always discussions about how to bring this information together, how to bring um, increased collaboration and coordination in the field. So from a number of different perspectives, these conversations were ongoing. And that led to um, a patient meeting in 2016, where we had a discussion about developing a patient reported registry. And it was at that meeting um, where we were discussing the Huntersville unique population, where the Melanoma Research Foundation's CureOM initiative committed to building this registry. And after many years of building this step-by-step -step from scratch, as you heard, we launched the vision registry in May of 2021 with the um, aims of recording global cases of ocular melanoma, advancing our understanding of the disease, and increasing collaboration in the field. And so the vision registry um, was formed, uh, and you can see it's an acronym here between CureOM and Vision Registry, um, we get teased that we like acronyms. And so the Vision Registry is an organized, uniformed data collection system that's bringing together real world evidence to improve patient outcomes. And as you can see on this slide on the right, um, as part of this effort, we have brought together um, stakeholders from you know, different sectors, both in our planning process and now in our implementation and execution process. We think it's very important to have all the stakeholders at the table um, as we think about this disease. And so really at the global level, by bringing together um, interdisciplinary cross-sector uh, individuals, we think that we can centralize knowledge and advance this disease. Um, and so I'm so excited to be able to show you this image of the landing page of the registry. Hopefully many of you listening to this have already seen it, you've been there. Um, but as I mentioned, we, um, we chose a platform um, that really felt like a, a blank canvas to us that had all of the um, building blocks that would allow us to build the registry, but that we could build it from the ground up specific to our needs in the ocular melanoma space. And that would allow us to be nimble so that as we collect data, if we have additional questions we want to ask, we can build on additional surveys. We can um, partner and collaborate with others in this space. And so um, it's so exciting, I think, for those of us who have um, been a part of this from the beginning to see it um, come together. Because if you can imagine taking block by block to build something, and then to finally see this launch and to see this landing page, um, I think that uh, it's just, it's very exciting. So um, as, um, again, hopefully many of you have experienced yourselves, when you um, go um, to the landing page, when you go online and you register, you then have an informed consent to fill out. So we have an ethics review board um, that has approved our study and all the materials, including the slides I'm showing today, um, have been approved by the ethics review board. And so you as a patient or a caregiver will come on and see the informed consent you sign it electronically, and then that will bring you into the registry where we have different surveys for you to fill out. We recognize that this is actually a lot of information to fill out, and eventually, hopefully, we will be able to capture patients at the time they're diagnosed, and then over time, they can update um, their uh, information as they go. This might be a little bit of a beast um, to do it retrospectively, um, but we really, we have support. Um, you can always call in and we can help walk you through different steps and you can sort of take it um, bit by bit and, and fill out your information. Um, you, um, what our hope is, is that you will come in and add information anytime something changes in your clinical status or at least once a year um, to give an update. So, you know, as I, um, as we're launching the vision registry, we're actually just um, six months in this week. Um, and I reflect back on our patient story. I think that, you know, what we're trying to accomplish with the vision registry of bringing 
all the different sectors and disciplines together with patients at the center, that was Greg's vision. And um, there was a talk that he gave at the very first scientific meeting um, that we had where he, where he challenged the researchers and clinicians in the audience to come together, to break down barriers, to collaborate, to be patient-centered, to challenge the status quo. And when I think about what he would say about the registry, because unfortunately he's not here to see it himself, I think he would be so proud that we're bringing all these different components um, together at this point. And I think as his disease advanced, it became even more clear to us that the disease is complex. And so our work necessarily has to mirror that complexity in terms of bringing people together and bringing different disciplines together. And similarly, I think for Summer, um, as her advocacy increased and she brought people together, she also was looking for people outside of Huntersville who could come in and help them in Huntersville. And she was connecting with other people um, to bring in resources. And the picture on the right um, is a Melanoma Research Foundation event um, near Huntersville. And she really advocated to bring in resources to her community um, to help uncover clues. And so when I think about the vision that Greg and Summer had and how they advocated for themselves and for this community, I really think that we are well on our way in achieving that with the vision registry. Um, I also think that they would be thrilled to know about our partnership with the Omni Registry. You'll hear from Dr. Richard Carvajal in just a minute about the Omni Registry, which is a physician inputted registry about patient data. Um, and I think this partnership really has the strength to unlock a lot of clues to ocular melanoma and really helps us reach our vision um, that much stronger. And here I just have a little example of, I think vision on its own, um, we can answer a lot of questions um, by just looking at the data collected from vision. Similarly for Omni, as you'll hear from Dr. Car Carvajal shortly, I think the Omni registry can answer a lot of questions on its own as well. I think vision and Omni together have the power to really think about clinical questions together with patient preferences, quality of life, um, and, and other uh, inputs as well. So I just, I think there's a lot of power in these two coming together. Um, and this is just a map to show you currently where we are. So the yellow, sorry, the blue dots that you see here um, are Omni sites. Um, the green dots are representative of where we currently have patients who have registered for the vision registry. Um, and so as you can see, um, this is really a global effort and um, we just launched the global component of the vision registry in August and we hope that this piece of it will continue to grow hand in hand with the Omni registry as well. And so if I were to boil down, I think really the key components of what vision is going to be able to offer the field at this point is really the integration of patient voices. And I think that's around patient preferences, our, to help us better understand quality of life um, and, and needs around that and how to address that, and then and connecting patients to clinical trials. And I'll speak more to that in just a minute. So um, I wanna share with you some of our early data. As I mentioned, um, we are just six months in and um, we really wanna be sharing data with the patient community as often as we can. Please consider this a little bit of a sneak peek. Um, as you'll see, uh, we're still, you know, understanding the platform to analyze the data. We're still understanding the data, cleaning the data, et cetera. But I didn't want to wait to have anything more polished before we got to share it with you all. So bear with me. This is kind of an early sneak peek, and we'll be happy to share more with you um, over the coming days, weeks, and months. So to date, we've had 200 people sign up for the vision registry. Out of those people, um, we've had 117 complete their profile. And out of those 117, we've had 80 people complete at least one survey. So I wanna make a pitch to everyone who's listening. Please sign up for the vision registry, complete your profile and complete your surveys. And again, I know it takes time and you may not be able to do it all in one setting. It may take multiple um, times. You may need to call us for support on how to do this. We wanna support you through this process. As I go through some of the data, you'll see the benefit um, of really completing uh, these surveys. 
Um, we're collecting um, a number of socio-demographic data points. Um, this gives you a, sort of a sense of um, what we're collecting in terms of understanding what the diagnoses are of people who are participating in the vision registry, where people are from. As you can see, we have a number of countries represented at this point. Um, breakdown of age, race and ethnicity. Um, we're looking at income, um, types of health insurance. And I'm showing you this today um, uh, to share with you what we're collecting. But ultimately, our hope is that we can um, sort of stratify along some of these lines so we can understand maybe people with certain types of health insurance aren't getting a particular kind of treatment or prognostic testing or something that they need. And so this will allow us to understand the patient experience better and how we as an advocacy organization and an advocate community can step in and help the patient community. So I'm, I'm sharing these with you just kind of at face value today, but our hope is, is that, um, that, that a lot of these um, data points can actually be instructive to helping us understand the patient experience better. Um, and then we ask this question about, um, would patients like to be informed of clinical trials? And I find this to be very exciting because we are currently working with a company who is helping us build a tool that will connect patients directly to clinical trials for which they are eligible. And so um, patients who are interested in this, and you can, it's, it's an opt-in option, but if you're interested, if you click this box that you're interested in this, eventually, hopefully in the coming months when we have the tool um, working, the, um, the, the screen, that is needed to alert you to trials for which you're eligible will be pre-populated by the information you enter into the vision registry. And then will kind of spit out to you a list of trials, clinical trials for which you are eligible in the ocular melanoma space. So we are really excited about that. And then of course, um, we ask questions to make sure that patients are aware of the Omni registry. And if they're not, that they can talk to their provider about that um, to, to um, engage in that, to participate in the Omni registry with their clinician as well. Um, and so just to um, kind of share with you a little bit of the data that we're collecting. Um, again, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna show you some patient preferences and quality of life data I thought you might be interested in. Um, today. So looking at our patients comfortable in making um, decisions about their care. And this is looking at the time of diagnosis. So we've had 51 people um, complete this survey, as you can see. And so this helps us understand the breakdown of how patients feel about decision making. And we actually ask a couple follow-up questions to this as well, to get a sense of if patients um, feel that they're shared decision making, if they're respected by their clinical team in the decision making, um, so um, as we collect more data in this, it'll help us understand, you know, how patients are feeling and, and how we might be able to support them better along their journey. Um, and then also thinking about what support services are patient, patients using. So these are really small numbers. Again, um, you know, we can't go off too much with only 10 entries, but I want to give you a sense of some of the information that we're collecting. So to understand what kinds of support services are people using at the time of diagnosis? Um, and, and then where did those support services come from? So, um, you know, are they coming from a treatment center? Are they com coming from a patient advocacy organization? Um, are they coming from somewhere else? Helping us really understand how patients are engaging in their care. Um, and then we ask those questions um, at the time of metastatic diagnosis as well. Um, are the patients finding these support services helpful? Again, these numbers are very small, so we can't put a lot of stock in them yet, but to give you a sense of what we're collecting, how we're using the data that, that you're entering. Um, so then this is looking for um, uh, at the time of um, metastatic disease, what support services were utilized by patients. So is there a difference between what support services patients need at the time of primary versus metastatic diagnosis? How can we best support patients? Again, where, where are those services coming from? And here you can see 21 unspecified. So this is just a place for me to plug. Um, please, if you have a preference or can you know tell us any information that really helps us because the unspecified is just, it, it's unclear for us. You know, we, we can't really analyze those, those data. And then this I think is an interesting question which um, will, be, will be really good to follow up on, but we ask you in the registry to rank in order of priority what's most important to you when making a decision about your care. And um, here I'm showing you um, what 
what patients listed in either choice one or two in order of priority. So this is the first or second priority in terms of making decisions about clinical care. And if you combine best clinical outcome with long-term survival and ability to receive care closer to home, more than half of patients have ranked those priorities, either first or second, um, which I think tells us a lot about patient preferences. Then if you go down to the third priority, you can see, again, this is a small number, only 16 people, but you can see that it diversifies um, really in this ranking, but it's very clear, I think, the message we're getting with the top two um, prioritizations. Um, and then um, here we've asked patients, again, this is only eight patients, but clearly at least two patients have had two episodes of metastasis. Um, this is where metastasis has shown up for those patients. Um, these are treatments that patients have had. Um, and as you can see, there's a big other um, chunk there. And this is what um, was, was written into the text box for that other category. So this will really help us understand, you know, if, if patients are going to different centers for their treatment, um, really having the patient provide this information, I think will help us um, have a strong understanding um, that's cross institution of the patient experience and what their care looks like. Um, again, um, where, did, where are patients getting information about their diagnosis and treatment? This will help us better understand how we can support patients at the time of diagnosis. And then the last two data slides I wanna share with you are on the quality of life survey. Um, and we only have, we have 39 total um, entries here, but only six of them are metastatic patients. And so I think we, you know, again, we need to um, have more patients enter their data to really make sense of this and understand this. But I wanted to share a couple of these with you today. So on the left, you'll see the question, um, I am able to work. And as you can see the spread, um, the blue um, are patients who've been diagnosed with primary disease and in green, you see metastatic patients, how they um, respond to that question. Um, and it does look like um, the majority of people at this point say they're very much able to work. Um, and then when patients respond to the statement, I'm able to enjoy life. You can also see that the majority of patients who have um, filled out this survey um, have answered quite a bit or very much. I think as we get more entries, it will be um, helpful to understand, does this look different for patients with primary disease versus metastatic disease? And if so, what can we do to support um, the patients along their journey? And then two other questions I thought would be interesting to look at today. On the left, the statement, I feel nervous. Um, and you can see um, uh, that the majority of patients say uh, a little bit, um, but really the weight is towards uh, less anxiety. Um, and at least in the you know, cohort who's filled this out. And then what patients respond to, I worry about dying. And again, the majority of patients um, answering a little bit, but there's a real spread in the middle there with um, some people really answering quite a bit. Um, and again, I think it will be important to understand um, how this evolves as we get more patients entering their information, particularly more patients with metastatic disease. One other thing that because we've built this registry from the ground up, we're able to do is if patients answer a question in a certain way, and we want to get more detail to that, we can have a follow-up survey to any of these. So we can say, oh, well, to patients who answer this question in a certain way, we want to get more details about what they mean about that answer. And so we can, you know, reach out to patients who answer that question a certain way. They tell us, you tell us how you want to be contacted, and we can reach out to you and gather more information that way. And then just a reminder that what you put in the text box in the open-ended questions also helps us understand um, how you're answering questions better. Um, and so, you know, as we're collecting more data, we are going to review everything that you enter into those text boxes to help us understand that. So I know that we're running short on time. Apologies for rushing through um, those data, but I really wanted to share some with you today. And I just want to thank um, all the patients who have entered their data to make that possible. I think that um, by you entering your data and us advancing the vision registry, this um, combined with all the efforts in the ocular melanoma space right now gives me a ton of hope for the future. Um, and you know, on a personal note, this um, advancement in the field um, will not be here in time to, um, to save Greg's life or to save, save Summer's life. Um, 
but it will be here in time to save many lives. And there will be, we will be able to save lives so that other little girls will not have to grow up without their father. And so that Thanksgiving tables will not have empty chairs. And so on behalf of my family and on behalf of Summer's family, um, by you participating in the registry, you are helping us unlock clues. You are helping yourselves, your families, all the families, we're all in this together. And I think together um, we can find a cure. And so I'm grateful to our international collaborators who are helping us um, advance the vision registry outside of the US in their home countries. Um, it's been amazing to have these global advocacy partners. Um, a huge thank you to our funders, including our grassroots um, patient uh, organizers, Summer and her family in the top right, as you see, who have helped us fund this registry from the ground up. Um, and just a reminder that you can be a part of this. You can help us make this change. So please, if you're a patient, join, um, share your data. If you're a researcher, we'd love for you to um, think about the vision registry in your research. Um, and we're always needing additional sponsorship um, if you have that availability too. So um, reach out to us if you'd like a vision registry brochure. We'd love um, to get these into clinics and around to patients. Um, so thank you so much for your time. And I will hand it over to Dr. Richard Carvajal, who Kylie already introduced, but I just want to sort of also thank Rich for all of his support with the Vision Registry and just this amazing partnership. Um, there is not a stronger advocate than you in the field, Rich. So thank you. And, you know, I'll just start off by saying it's, I, I can't believe it's been 10 years. Um, and use the term grassroots. I feel like 10 years ago, this really was a grassroots effort that you built to kind of build this ocular melanoma community of patients, researchers, physicians. And, and it's, it's amazing. It's all culminated in this, this incredible uh, international registry. So congratulations. Um, so what I want to do, I just want to spend maybe 10 minutes um, talking about this parallel effort that we have um, that we call Omni. And it's been built together in parallel with vision. Omni is one of those, you know, another one of those acronyms that we have to do that stands for International Ocular Melanoma Natural History Study. And from the kind of physician clinical researcher standpoints, the origins of this registry came from the uh, challenges we had in interpreting our data. You know, uvula melanoma, it's a rare disease. It's hard to do big clinical trials. And so oftentimes we do these small studies that show these results and it's hard to figure out, is it really good? <laughs> Did the treatment, is it really promising or, or not? And to try to answer those questions, um, we've had prior efforts to build what we call these real world data um, sources. Um, and the first, one of the first ones we did um, was what we call this, this Puma uh, registry. And this was an international effort, a really a, a huge effort where we pulled data from um, 25 clinical trials. We had data from nearly a thousand patients. And what we wanted to do was just see how those patients who were treated on various studies and with various interventions, how they did to give us a benchmark to compare, you know, how our, our current clinical trial patients did. And this was very, very useful. But one of the weaknesses of this is um, by the time we finished this study, most of our patients were being treated uh, with checkpoint blockade, with immunotherapy outside of clinical trials. Um, and, um, you know, that's where a lot of our clinical trials were going and, and so forth. And there was only like 10% of patients on this initial Puma effort were treated with checkpoint blockade. And we knew we had to continue that effort to, you know, build these data sets, build these historical controls and help us better develop some of these new therapies. Um, you know, I, I do want to highlight that the use of this real world data to help um, develop new treatments for cancer, um, it's not new. And this is something that's been going on for a long time. Um, and I just highlight here that real world data has been used by the US FDA to support what we call post market surveillance efforts. So that's pretty common. You know, once a drug's approved, we need to collect more information, like the COVID vaccine, right? How effective is it? What are the side effects? Um, now, the use of real world data to get a drug approved, it's a little bit less common, um, but there are definitely multiple examples in cancer. So it's, it's, it's less common, but it is used particularly in rare cancers. I'm not going to go through this data, but I'm just going to say that this drug called blinatumumab, which it's, it's a little bit like the Bentafuff, really. It's another bispecific type drug. 
uh, was approved for a, a rare blood cancer based upon a comparison with real world data. Um, this other immunotherapy for Merkel cell cancer, another rare skin cancer that was approved in part using real world data. Um, and this um, palbociclib drug was approved for men with breast cancer, again, based on off of real world data. Um, so, you know, the, the hope was to um, build a real world data set that we could use, um, share with industry, um, share with other clinical researchers to try to facilitate drug development. And as an example of that, we've, we've this is one example where we've used a historical data set. Um, this was a clinical trial where we um, looked at a drug called crizotinib, which shuts down this protein called MEK. And we wanted to see that if we gave patients after a treatment of the primary uveal melanoma, this crizotinib pill um, in the adjuvant setting and the preventative setting, could it reduce the risk of the cancer coming back? And in um, kind of this green blue here, this is kind of how the patients did. Where we want them to be is we want all the patients to be what we call relapse-free survival survivors. So we want the line up there. And you can see that over time, um, patients did unfortunately develop recurrent disease. And it was hard to tell, was this good or was it not good because we didn't have a randomization. And so here, what we did was uh, we pulled data from another um, data set of historical controls and matched them with our patients, right? Based off of gender and these other characteristics. And so we created what we call the synthetic control. And so although our trial was not a randomized clinical trial, uh, we could kind of uh, create a synthetic control. And that's the red line here. And what you can kind of see, I think, is that these lines basically overlap. And that suggests that, you know, unfortunately our clinical trial was not successful. We do not think that crisotinib is an effective isometric clinical um, therapy. Um, but the use of the synthetic control um, allowed us to do this study without the need to randomize patients to placebo, right? We could answer the question with a, a fewer number of patients having to go on this clinical trial. So, um, you know, although it's a, it's a negative example, I think it's an important example of the use of some of these data. <clears throat> so after um, the um, development of that PUMA effort, uh, when we decided that we had to um, prospectively continue collecting information, uh, under the auspices of this group called the International Rare Cancers Initiative, uh, we built a, this coalition of centers uh, within the United States, it's highlighted here, uh, the United Kingdom and Australia, and we've also started working with sites in Canada as well as Germany, um, where um, the, the physicians and the research teams at the centers would directly enter in um, data about the patients with uveal melanoma, what they were treated with, um, what the molecular characteristics are, how they did, in a way that we could share the data, um, look at differences in treatment and outcome across different centers, um, and just, just build this international um, data set which is really unprecedented um, for this disease. Just to give you a sense of, of the power of this data, just looking at the initial um, centers in the US, the UK and Australia, we wanted to see that once all the centers are up and running, how many cases could we collect? And if we look at the um, number of retrospective cases, that is the patients who've already been seen there, who have were followed there or where there's already data, um, across these sites, there's, there's almost 2,000 patients um, worth of data. Um, and then if we're looking at moving forward, how many um, cases can we enter in? How many patients do we see? It's, it's nearly 700 a year. And so you can imagine uh, the amount, the power of the, this data is, is you know, it's, it's really incredible. And if, if this can be done, even just for five years, it would be just a, a tremendous resource for uh, investigators. And so, so where are we? Um, kind of, you know, as with vision, we're really just starting to ramp up. Um, Columbia was the first center open, um, Jefferson the second, um, a couple of centers in Australia and MD Anderson, a little bit more recent. But as of October, we've got, got 165 patients enrolled um, and, and the numbers are starting to grow. Other centers like Memorial and MGH will be coming online shortly. Uh, contracts with the United Kingdom are, are being signed off. So this has been a little bit logistically challenging as I think it, things have been with vision, but uh, they are definitely moving forward. Um, now, again, as I said, and as Sarah said, this was built in parallel with vision. Um, as she showed the data that's collected in vision and the data that's collected in Omni um, are 
um, unique data sets. There's some shared data being collected, but there's some a lot of unique data collected in each. And there's great power in combining those data sets. Um, and so um, in, in our registry, um, we're prospectively asking, um, you know, are patients enrolled in vision? Uh, if not, would they like to be? Uh, and we are uh, giving all of the patients who enroll on Omni information about vision. They're encouraged to enroll. Um, so we've, we've already started mining the data, even though the numbers are, are fairly small in ours. Um, and uh, one of the questions we've looked at is, what are the implications of uh, mutations in a certain gene, something called SF3B1, which we find in about 20, 25% of bubial melanomas. I'm not gonna go through this slide, but, but what I can say is that this has already resulted in collaborations um, and publications um, and we're already generating new, new and important data from, um, from the work even early in this course. Um, so again, this slide, I, I don't wanna underestimate the importance of this, the data that we're collecting, the pathology results, all of the molecular data, um, treatment, um, uh, treatments administered as well as treatment outcomes. Um, um, you know, that, that data we're gonna be collecting very, very carefully. Um, the data that's gonna be uh, collected in vision, the quality of life data, the lifestyle questions, perceptions, and patient preferences. That's stuff that we can't collect, um, but it's vitally important. And, you know, you can imagine the power of, of um, combining the data of, you know, how did patients do on certain treatments? How did patients feel on that treatment? Right, that's, that's really the power, because we want treatments that are effective, um, um, but we also want treatments that um, maintain that quality of life and keep patients feeling well. And this is a way to look at that. So let me just close with the, the acknowledgement slide. There's just a huge number of people working both on Omni in Australia, the UK, Europe, North America, um, and then all the folks here at the MRF. Um, the, the platforms that we're working with, Pulse Info Frame, that's our partner with uh, um, Omni uh, and GBT with Vision. Uh, and these are just folks who um, help Sarah uh, and me and everyone just, just put this together. Um, and it's but just been a, a fantastic process. So let me stop there. Thank you, Rich. And thank you, Sarah. That was fantastic. Um, we are gonna start with some questions. And again, I just, as a reminder to all of our viewers, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A. And then after we're through with questions, we're gonna take a short little break before we go into the next section. So before um, we take some questions from viewers, I wanna start off with Sarah and a question for you regarding the registry and to get your insight on why you think it's better for patients to put in their own data than to go to their doctor and ask them to put the data in for them. Can you kind of give some insight onto why it's really important for patients to have that role? Yeah, um, thank you for that and I think, um, Rich sort of touched on this um, towards the end of his presentation, but, um, you know, I think to really understand the patient experience, patient preferences, um, we need to hear that from the patient. And we don't want that to, uh, you know, be, um, go through anybody else. Um, the patients know themselves the best. They know their experiences the best. Um, and, you know, I've been on both sides of the exam table, so to speak, um, as a physician myself and as a caregiver to Greg. Um, and I think it certainly gave me a very different perspective to be on the other side and to feel that experience. And, um, and, and no one can explain that experience except for the patient themselves. I think the other reason that I would um, mention is both in terms of some of the um, demographics and some of the exposures, for example, you know, where people live or their occupations, um, in addition to maybe a couple of the pieces of the data that does overlap between Omni and Vision, um, is that the patient, the, in, the information they're putting in, it's following them. But if, you know, a clinician has, has a view of a patient at their center. So if I go see Rich as a patient tomorrow, he sees me at Columbia, but he doesn't see what I do if I go to MD Anderson next week. But I, as the patient, I hold all of those stories. I hold that perspective across 
centers. Um, and so I think those are kind of the main two reasons. One, because as no one knows the patient experience better than the patient themselves and their families. Um, and no one has that view of that, you know, cross institution patient experience better than the patient themselves. Now, let me add to that. It's, it's, you know, we actually tried to formally ask that question of, of how good are physicians at um, understanding how well a patient is feeling. Um, and so in some of our trials, we've done things where we've asked the patients on a scale of one to 10, how are you feeling? What's your quality of life? Where 10 is good and one is not good. Uh, and then we'd ask the physician, um, what do you think the patient's quality of life is? Um, and it was very discordant. <laughs> So our understanding of the patient experience, I think, is, 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 is not great sometimes. So, so kind of to that point, you know, what do you all think the barriers are for patients to actually put their data in? You know, like, what are some of the barriers for them engaging in this process? And what, what would you say to them to encourage them, you know, to kind of dispel some of the myths in terms of, of adding their information to a, to a global registry? Um, well, I think um, potentially um, the first barrier, and, and this is not just a hunch. I mean, we've had patients on our steering committee and along this whole process. So this is information, you know, input that we've gotten along the way. Um, so number one, I think um, concern for security and safety around the information that people are entering. Um, and that was really important to us that um, we chose a provider, and I know to Rich too, um, that had a lot of experience with data security. Um, and so we chose Global Vision Technologies, um, one, because uh, of their experience over many decades managing large data sets and the security measures that they have. And we've made sure to have like legal oversight that we're in compliance with North American um, and European um, standards around that. So for me, that you know, I think that is one barrier that we've heard. Um, after that, I think some of it is, um, you know, as I showed in my slide, we have a lot of surveys and they can, I think, be extensive and a little bit overwhelming. And, you know, many of us, I, I put myself at the top of the list, do not always feel so comfortable with technology. Um, and so I would say that, you know, I think that that is potentially another barrier. And we've had many steering committee meetings pouring over data sets, thinking, how do we collect all the information we need to be able to answer questions in the field to advance research? But how do we also not just have the patient sit at their computer for 10 hours? And so we, you know, worked really hard to balance those, that tension and those priorities. Um, and to those, I would just say that one, you know, we have um, an email and a phone number for vision registry, and we are very happy to like literally be on the phone with someone as they start filling this out. Um, we are happy to answer questions at any point. And I think as clinicians become more familiar with vision, they too can help patients. But, you know, as the CureOM team and the vision team, we are very much here to help patients through that. So I think those are some of the barriers. Um, I think along the way, we want to hear from the patient community if there are other barriers that we're missing because we really want to address them. And so, you know, we check our email and the phone number every day. Um, we're, we're always here and we really want to connect with patients to make sure that we are um, breaking down those barriers. I don't know, Rich, if you have other thoughts there. You know, it is a lot of, it is a lot of work. Right? It's a lot of time, I think, that uh, people are investing into this registry when they input their data. And so it's very important that I think, you know, we make sure that they know that their data is being used, that it's for providing useful information. And so, you know, the early um, looks at the data that you presented, I think that's really, really important. Um, and that's feedback that we have to give to all their participants so they know what we're finding and, you know, why it's important that they keep on updating their data. Absolutely, I think the feedback loop is, is definitely critical. So, so let's talk a little bit about that because, you know, we just launched in, in May, um, we just went global, so we're incorporating data internationally now, which is really exciting. So let's talk about how frequently the data is analyzed, because again, with that feedback loop that could help inform researchers for their projects, help inform industry, drug development, help inform patients. So can we talk a little bit about how frequently, in, in terms of both registries, the data is being analyzed and um, move forward? 
you want to go first? Um, <laughs> I can well, call on, on you guys if you want. Yeah, I mean, I can say say for Omni, it's um, you know there are a few questions that we're we're trying to answer very aggressively, and and we're we're trying to make sure the data we're collecting is is very clean. And so that SF three B one story, I think it's very important to us. We're very interested in looking at what we call these tertiary mutations, um, and so um, you know to be you know completely transparent, my effort right now has been focused on getting the sites open. Um, but the sites that are open, I, I want to be sure they know what we want to focus on. That is, I want there to be a clear question in the near term that we want to answer to help um, kind of spur data entry. Um, um, I, you know, I, when are good times to kind of share the data? For Omni, it's, it's housed under the auspices of the International Rare Cancer Initiative. So at, at that, we have one meeting in conjunction with ASCO of that group. And so that's where I intend to do the formal um, bigger presentations of the data cuts. Um, but I think it'd be very reasonable to do data cuts twice a year, to be honest, ideally. And on our end, um, we, as we've been getting this up and running and, you know, building this bit by bit, we have at least once a week, if not more often, meetings with the technical host, Global Vision Technologies, to be looking on the back end and seeing how things are working making sure things are working smoothly. Um, we've already, um, you, you know, we've gotten feedback from people about um, how different questions are worded, et cetera, and worked with our ethics review board to um, shift some of those questions. A lot of our effort has been working with our international partners um, to help adapt any of the surveys to the international setting. Um, now we have turned our attention now that we've been getting data into the system to analyze the data. So we're learning the back end of um, the uh, technology, et cetera. I mean, we're looking at data. Well, Jackie Kraska, um, who's really overseeing this, I mean, she's looking at it maybe daily, um, multiple times a week, and we're meeting at least once or twice a week altogether discussing it. Um, we have committed to having an annual report for sure, so once a year. But, you know, in preparing the slides for today's presentation, we discussed the possibility of, you know, sharing with the OM community in some emails or on social media, some, you know, graphs or charts as we're analyzing it to share that out um, so that, you know, patients are getting that um, uh, feedback loop. And, you know, hopefully by seeing like, oh, if something is unspecified, we can't actually analyze that data is helpful for people to see like how it's being used on the back end. So we're working with this data on a daily basis and thinking about this. And I think, um, you know, we have a, a larger team meeting with Rich right now. I think it's once a month, Rich, um, but I anticipate that's gonna increase too as we work, we bring statisticians on and we really think about, you know, you have to get to the point where you're bringing in data. And then once you have the data, then you, you start kind of you know, playing in the sandbox, if you will, and thinking about these things. And I think the next step is for us to bring in um, statistician to really help us um, think about each of these questions and how to um, think about them uh, collaboratively across questions and across registries. Right. We have time for a couple more questions. One from the audience. Um, Sarah, you referenced another registry in your talk, and there are a couple other registries in the OM space. So one of the questions is, is, how is the vision registry different from some of the other registries that are out there right now? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so as I mentioned, there are registries at different levels. So there are you know, state uh, registries, the state cancer registry, um, different institutions maintain registries that are institution specific. As um, Rich mentioned, in his talk, um, different clinical trials will have um, their own registry for that clinical trial. Um, and, you know, and also different organizations um, have different registries. So different rare diseases have, um, you know, registries for, for that disease. Um, NORD, for example, the Organization of Rare Diseases, they have a host of registries and they look at um, diseases, you know, rare diseases across the board to compare rare disease to rare disease. Um, I think ours is unique, one, in that um, it's patient reported, cross-institution, global, we're working very closely with global um, advocacy partners, um, 
and that it is nimble. It sort of, I think that's part of the reason it took us um, five years to build it and get it off the ground. Um, but I think it puts us in a really good place now because we aren't tied to a larger institution. And so we are able to respond to new research questions very nimbly. We are able to pivot and integrate which, with the Omni registry. We are able to pivot and integrate with um, our global partners and add new surveys from a global perspective. So um, I think that our registry has a lot of flexibility and I think um, the patient community understandably so, and I think us included, Rich, felt some frustration in, a, in you know, the five years it took us to establish this registry, but I think we're really seeing the benefits of that now as we're able to be um, flexible and nimble, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm so proud of Sarah, of, like of what you built. I mean, it did take a long time to build this, but it's a really fantastic, um, you know, program. Um, I would say that even in the academic space, there are multiple multi-center um, ocular melanoma registries going on, and, and they're all a little bit different, you know. Um, and so I I like to look at these as not directly, not really like competing efforts, you know. But I'd love to see this more of a, a collaboration. Um, for instance, that adjuvant crizotinib example I showed where we created the synthetic control arm, that data I actually got from Bill Harbour's Hoog registry, right? Um, and and that's, that's a fantastic registry that is really built by ocular oncologists. And it's got a lot of data from patients from the time of diagnosis uh, of, of the ocular melanoma, whereas ours has been focus on the development of metastasis and outcomes there. So even in these two academic registries, there are, there are differences not entirely over, not fully overlapping, right? And I think we do work together. Yeah, and, and on that, thank you for bringing up the Coog registry, Rich, because just also to mention that, you know, Rich and I have, um, you know, talked with that group as well, and we've talked with them about vision. Um, and again, you know, the sort of call to action at the end of my talk was really wanting to work with um, different efforts um, and different researchers and be able to use our data um, in different ways. So we really welcome that collaboration. Great, and Sarah, I think that's that's another plug too, to have if there's other groups out there that wanna reach out and have those discussions you know, we'll have a vision registry slide with contact information. So that's a great, great segue to have people reach out and, and open up that dialogue. So, so thank you. And thank you to the viewer who asked that great question. Um, so we are a little bit over, we are going to take a break. We're, we're going to take a 20 minute break so that viewers can grab a snack and stretch and uh, check out the Castle Biosciences breakout room, which will be open during the break. And we're going to share a link to that in the chat. So you'll see that there, there it is right there. So you can visit the breakout room and we will resume back in 20 minutes to talk about advocacy in the rare disease space. So thank you again, Rich and Sarah, and we will see you back here in about 20 minutes.